My name's Ben McKenzie. I'm a specialist emergency physician and I've been a specialist now for 15 years. I also work as a retrieval doctor for an ambulance service and I've been doing that for 15 years as well. I'm Tamara McKenzie. Um, I trained originally as an optometrist and have worked in health policy um, and areas of accreditation and regulation since then. Um, and I'm Ben's wife and um, a mum to three kids. So Max um, <clears throat> was staying with his grandma as he did once a week for a long time. He ate an apple crumble with some finely ground walnuts in it that was in some catering um, that he accidentally ate. Um, shortly after eating the apple crumble with the walnuts in it, Max became itchy and he started to get symptoms of asthma. My mum phoned me to say that Max was having an allergic reaction. She didn't know what it was to, but they'd just eaten an apple crumble. And Max was in the shower and I was around the corner. And so I said, can you put Max on? And I spoke to him and said, I'll be there really soon. He said, that's fine, I'm just having a shower. And then I got there and realized that he was having slight problem breathing or just that he was like his breath was like harder at work and um so he gave himself the EpiPen and called triple O. When paramedics arrived to assess Max, Max's oxygen levels were 100% and he was able to talk in sentences. He was able to tell the paramedics that his asthma was due to anaphylaxis. The paramedics were with Max for half an hour before he had a respiratory arrest in the ambulance. And during that time, he had a linear deterioration in terms of his oxygen levels going down and his difficulty breathing going up until he reached the point of decompensation. I was at work in my retrieval job, in my retrieval uniform, and I realized that things weren't going well and had to leave work. I rapidly made my way to the hospital and went into the resuscitation cubicle that Max was in. And I arrived there 17 minutes after Max. And I immediately realised that he hadn't been intubated, which I couldn't quite believe, I remember a sense of disbelief. And it, but simultaneously I realised what the problem was and that even though Max's uh, heartbeat had stopped, that it would start again with oxygen. And it did when he was finally intubated. When I arrived in the resuscitation cubicle, the, the thing that I saw was that they, that the resuscitation team was doing a pulse check or a rhythm check to see uh, if Max had a heartbeat. And so they paused CPR for that. And during that, that's when I walked into the room and I saw on the monitor that Max had no heartbeat apart from the occasional dying heartbeat that's not normal. We call that an agonal rhythm. And, and I could see that uh, the problem was that he wasn't being oxygenated properly. I realized that there was no one leading the resuscitation and that it was completely chaotic. And so I became the de facto team leader. And after the third failed attempt at intubation it was only the first that I'd witnessed, but knew that too much time had gone past. I immediately directed a surgical airway as the, as the team leader. And the way I did that was to say that he needs a surgical airway, 
that he needs a scalpel finger bougie. And then I yelled to get the scalpel. Yeah, I can picture it. I can picture Ben coming in and I was so relieved that he was there. Within a couple of minutes of Max having a tube and getting oxygen, his heartbeat started, as of course it would. And then it was actually possible to oxygenate Max despite him having severe asthma, despite him having vomit in his right lung, despite the tube being pushed too far down in and just being in that right lung, he could still, I could still oxygenate him with a bag and an endotracheal tube um, to a point where he was no longer sustaining hypoxic brain injury. But it was too late. It, it took 23 minutes to intubate Max instead of three. Max then went on to ECMO and was stable and, and made a physical recovery. But he died 13 days later from severe brain injury. Because Max had spent such a long time without any oxygen getting to his brain, um, his brain became extremely damaged and so that even uh, brain signals like keeping your heart going were damaged and that's why he suddenly stopped unpredictably, uh, unpredictably died um, 13 days after he had anaphylaxis. So we've managed to put together a, a simulation of what is the best practice to manage somebody who presents with a hypoxic asthma or anaphylaxis arrest. It involves a priority being uh, ABC. Anaphylaxis is the quintessential emergency medicine problem where all ABC well, airway, breathing and circulation might simultaneously be compromised and it's time critical to avoid hypoxic brain injury to manage each of those simultaneously. And that is, uh, that is something that is our core business and that we should have standards about. As healthcare workers, we go to work trying to do our best every single day. Um, sometimes things go wrong and we really need to be mature and constructive about how we deal with situations when things go wrong. And I very much hope that these videos will be, will, will help that process. So the video that you're about to see unfolds very quickly, but the idea is that we tried to film it in real time and um, using the AMAX 4 principles uh, that are in the lecture series, which are not, uh, not new principles and not new content, but just framed in a specific structured way to help people who face a uh, catastrophic, uh, unexpected resuscitation scenario uh, unfolding in front of them. Um, it, it's a really useful structure and it gives clear uh, it, clear endpoints about uh, what's required to, to manage a hypoxic arrest and, and why, uh, why different therapies are uh, emphasised. But, but it's, it, it, we filmed it as, as best practice, just, just a routine resuscitation. Hopefully you find the, the video helpful in um, teaching the next generation of emergency medicine specialists, but also uh, staying current in our own job as we progress through our careers because every minute really does matter. Can I get a G 
GCS? Um, so, which resource beds available? This one's free. Okay, can you overhead page um, category one to resource one and specifically airway doctor to resource one? Sure. sure. Potential staff, potential staff, could this have a category one to resource one, please? Category one to resource one, airway doctor is required. Thank you. Okay, um, registrar one, you will be um, uh, in resource one with this peri rest asthma and access. I need you to get drugs ready, starting off with adrenaline push, do uh, push bolus doses, yeah. um, one milligram in 10 mils. Okay. All right, I'll so see you in there. Breathing. Lots and lots of wheeze and becoming hypoxic. And how's the circulation? 
He's had a blood pressure of 160 on 80 to start with, tachycardic with a heart rate of 140, still has a palpable pulse. Okay, great. Thank you. 100 you. marks of adrenaline given. Airway doctor, how is the airway? Uh, minimal respiratory efforts, he's really tight, and uh, I think there might be a bit of seizure activity there as well. Okay, circulation doctor, can I ask that you give that 100 milligrams of rocuronium now? Yeah. Our priorities are going to be to get the patient across onto our bed and then to secure the airway. Can I just ask airway nurse that we have the laryngoscopy ready? Yes, the back is ready. Okay. Okay, we're going to keep the patient on the paramedic monitoring until the airway is secured. One, One minute. Three to roll. One, two, three. Back one, two, three, and then your call now for the slide. All the way across on three. One, two, three. Okay, airway doctor, please three. perform a video laparoscopy and tell three. me what you can see. Okay, it's a grade two view. Very identitous legs. Pulse still present, Scott. It's really difficult passing the booty. The heart rate is dropping. Okay, stop, airway doctor, stop. And I want you to bag valve mass and vent uh, ventilate the patient. Circulation doctor, he's a scalpel. Please perform a surgical airway. Okay, I can feel the chronic Do you want me to cut? Yes, please yeah. make a cut. Putting now. Okay, okay, great cut. Two minutes. minutes. Okay, you can feel the chronic ring, sharp. Bougie, please. All right, Bougie's in. Tube, please. Tube filling all the mouse. And I want you to pass the tube, tube, the cuff just below the skin, please. Okay, tube's in. Bougie out. The knee is out. The cuff, please. All right, here, cuff being completed. Cuff up. Cuff up. Cuff up. Ventilate the patient. A rate of eight to ten breaths a minute. Gently ventilate. No peep. So even though it feels tight, I want you to continue to gently back valve mass the patient. Circulation nurse, please could you get five milligrams of IV midazolam and give that as a bolus. So an equal area and drill that bilateral significant ways. Can you please give 100 micrograms of IV adrenaline? Sure. And now please, so we've got an end tidal trace, could you please attach our monitoring, get a blood pressure and oxygen saturations as a priority. All right, 100 marks of adrenaline's in. Thank you. So we've got our end tidal CO2 trace. The tube is tied. Sats on. ECG on. All right, and we've got the Sats probe on. Sats probe is on. Waiting for a Sats and a heart rate. There's still a palpable pulse scribe. Great. I'm getting air entry. Okay, drugs that we need to get ready. Um, can the patient now have the five milligrams of IV midazolam? Five Commence the ketamine okay. infusion for sedation. Commence the adrenaline infusion at 30 mics a minute. So 5 milligrams of Midaz is in. Adrenaline yep. infusion. Give it a ketamine infusion as well. Adrenaline infusion is connected. Sats at 83%. Can we please give a bolus dose of 8 milligrams of IV dexamethasone? 10 millimoles of magnesium sulfate over 10 minutes. And our IV, IV salbutamol, 250 mics IV, please. So magnesium, I'll give the um, salbutamol infusion. So guys, just to summarise, we've got a secure airway. We're yes. able to ventilate the patient, but still has a tight chest. Correct. We've got oxygen saturations now of 82% with a high end tidal CO2. We've got a heart rate of 144, and our blood pressure, our last blood pressure was... Blood pressure 14681. Circulation doctor, once you've completed giving the drugs, please can I ask that you liaise with ICU for our ECMO team? Yeah, we'll do So it's going to take a bit of time for these medications to, to be working, but I anticipate that we we'll continue to ventilate via the bag until we are happy that we are able to reliably oxygenate and ventilate the patient. Then we'll transfer over to our ventilator. Yep, I'll get the ventilator ready. So it's coming up, heart rate recovered. Alright, thanks everyone, great yes. job. So the things that went wrong for Max were that he didn't get enough adrenaline that he didn't get enough oxygen. And that is why his heart stopped, but it was the asthma that made him stop breathing. It was the bronchospasm that made him stop breathing in the back of the ambulance. He ended up having a surgical airway and was presumably a difficult airway when 
three attempts at laryngoscopy were made, but that's not why he stopped breathing. He had laryngeal edema because it took so long for laryngoscopy, laryngoscopy to, to occur. Um, intubation was recommended. Intubation for Max was uh, indicated five minutes before he arrested, probably. And he didn't get an endotracheal tube until 40 minutes after he uh, had a respiratory arrest. As a parent, when something like this happens, tragedy like this, there's only really two things. I mean, firstly, I want Max back and that's not possible. So the one thing parents need is all of the information, what happened, what went wrong, what could have happened differently, what should have happened differently. Um, what are the learnings from this? Um, what are all the facts? And that's really important to, to help grieve and to help understand and to help work through what's happened. Secondly, we want to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone else's child and anyone else's family because it's a horrible thing that I wouldn't wish upon anyone. And so we hope that anything we can do after Max's death in terms of raising awareness and amongst medical practitioners and amongst um, the general population about how to stop this happening again, then that's all we can want. And I just hope that we manage to stop this happening again. Being transparent is part of the healing process. Um, embracing learning opportunities that arise when mistakes happen is the mature way of dealing with this and the most constructive way of dealing with, with tragedies that happen. So the videos and, and lecture presentations that I've put together are really for the critical care community as the intended audience. So that includes paramedics, it includes specialist emergency medicine doctors, it includes general practitioners who are working in rural and remote medicine, it includes intensive care specialists, it includes anaesthetists. The way I present some of the information uh, is uh, personal but has a really important medical message. And there's no new content that's provided, but it's provided in a structure that is very clear and unambiguous about what our goal should be in, in this clinical scenario. And I really hope that it's useful to you in your own practice. And I really hope that it's uh, something that you can use to help teach the next generation of, of critical care clinicians. And I really hope that no young person dies from asthma or anaphylaxis if they reach healthcare uninjured um, because uh, that should be our standard of care.